Um, we'll be recording this as we have with the previous two plant talks. And then finally, next week, look for a very brief survey from us. Um, in your email inbox, we're just going to ask you a couple questions. We'd love some feedback on our plant talks this year and some suggestions for topics for next year. So we plan to do these again next week, uh, Next, no, not next weekend, next winter. Um, they were very successful and we were so pleased to connect with all of you during the, the doldrums of winter. So thanks for being here. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Sarah Buckley. Sarah is the Sustainable Landscape Coordinator for Nebraska Statewide Arboretum and the Nebraska Forest Service. She splits her time between these two entities. And she actually started here as a youngster when she was a college intern in 2015, and then officially came on board as a staff member in 2017. And we are super lucky to have her skills and expertise. So she's gonna talk to us today with us about winter in the garden. So, or the winter garden. So I will hand it over to her now. Thanks, Michelle. Just checking, you can still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So I'm sorry, my audio is not very fun to listen to. We tried to fix it. Um, and our result was that we couldn't hear me at all. So <laughs> this is what we get. I'm gonna share my screen. So you can see my presentation. Uh, and today is mostly just going to be about appreciating winter in the garden. Uh, occasionally, I've gotten some comments that like, well, the garden just doesn't exist in the winter. And that's not true um, at all. It does exist. And there's ways we can engage with it. And then there's also some ways we can plan ahead um, for maybe making our garden even more fun in the winter. So the first question that I want to answer is why <laughs> would we want to go outside when my phone says it's 13 degrees and the wind chill's even lower than that? Um, and the answer I have for you is because that's why we did all this work, is to go out in it. Um, it doesn't really do us a whole lot of good to spend hours weeding and watering um, and all the money that we spend on plants if we never go look at it or we never touch it or we never enjoy it. And sometimes it doesn't necessarily mean going outside if the weather isn't our favorite. These pictures, I just took these pictures while I was eating breakfast this morning at my front window. Um, we sit, I, my toddler and I sit here and look out at our fluffy little um, sweetie friends and our bird feeders and this garden that we're planning to work on in the spring. Uh, and I'm really excited that, you know, We've done a lot of our garden work in the backyard where we have to go outside to enjoy it. And this garden will be the first one we've created where we can sit inside and look at it, even when, you know, the weather's not inviting us out. But I would challenge you that we are Nebraskans and maybe six degrees is too cold for a nice block, but I don't think 25 is. Um, I own a nice coat and a nice hat, and I might not spend as much time out there as I would on a 70 degree day but there's not a whole lot of weather that truly stops us when we want to do something. Um, so here's my ideas for how we can feel green when it's cold outside and it's not looking very green. We can take a walk or a hike. We can um, go bird watching. We can notice specific details where in the summer we're overwhelmed by so much stuff happening in the winter of the garden really, um, tears itself down to its bare bones and there's a lot of details we can stop and look at. Um, and then we can stay green with our practices. Um, our focus on sustainability doesn't have to end when winter starts. So we're gonna start with ways to get outside and we'll move on to some ways that we can stay inside and we can plan ahead um, when the weather's truly stopping us from going out. So when we're out in nature in the cold, one of the things that, that I notice that's different than when I'm out in the summer is that because the leaves are off the trees and the plants and maybe we have snow cover or maybe we don't, sound moves a lot different through the landscape. So um, if you think about, if you've ever been in the mountains in the snow, 
it's really interesting the sounds that you do hear and you don't hear. It's just completely different than what travels um, through greenery in the summer. So maybe that means that we can hear birds more. Um, sometimes it also means we can hear traffic a little more. But I, I think I've noticed that sometimes snow really changes that. It lets us hear the sounds that are close to us, our, our birds and animals around us, the wind in our trees. And it kind of dampens how far that sound moves. So, um, you know, from my house in the summer, I can't hear the highway very well. I live in a small town where, you know, in the winter when the trees are off the leaves, I can hear the highway sound. But as soon as it snows, some of that sound just, just slows down a little bit and I can go back to hearing, you know, what's, what's really around me. It's not just our trees, grasses, the way that wind moves through grasses in the winter, I just think it's beautiful. Um, it's it's just fun to see. I could I could just take pictures of wind in, in the grass forever. Um, sometimes the movement is explicit. It's, you know, in this picture on the left, if wind blew through these grasses, we would hear it. Um, and we would see the grasses moving. Sometimes movement is just an aesthetic or a design principle. So these grasses on the right aren't necessarily moving, but there's movement in what we're seeing. We've got these grasses swirling around um, around each other. So there's there's like all sorts of different sounds and movements that we can stop and appreciate. Whereas in the summer, just think of how much sound there is. There's birds, there's other animals, there's insects, there's sprinklers and mowers and so much happening. Um, sometimes it's nice in the winter to just like step back and hear a couple things. Texture stands out a lot more in the winter. I know this isn't a surprise to anyone. Any talk on appreciating the outdoors in the winter is gonna talk about bark because it's what we see the most clearly. Um, there, I mean, it's just, so cool to see the bark texture stand out so clearly against the snow. Um, whereas in the summer, we've got so much else going on in this landscape that um, we would have to take even more care to notice the bark. Um, there was a tree on campus. I didn't, I didn't identify it. We were walking by it the other day, right after it rained. And I noticed that in the bare winter landscape, the rain on this bark just made it shine in this deep red color that was really pretty. So we've got our peely bark textures, but we've also just got our deep rugged bark textures um, in trees that we see all the time. I mean, how many of us walk by cottonwoods and Kentucky coffee trees constantly? Um, and in the summer, I'm looking at the cottonwood for the pretty wind moving through its leaves and the sound that it makes. But in the winter, I mean, look at this. I could fit my hand in, <laughs> in this crack right here. Um, and it could be fun to take a look at this. There's a lot of insects that uh, overwinter in these cracks. And so you could explore looking for what's using these cracks as shelter in the winter. Texture wise, um, if you are leaving your leaves for the winter or you're leaving your landscape plants standing, there's so much texture to find. This is a goldenrod in a in a prairie restoration setting. And this is just a combination of, of grasses and evergreens on campus right outside our offices. And these textures are always here all summer, but in the summer, it's the color that we see. Um, if, if we were looking at this left-hand picture in the summer, we'd be seeing the bright yellow pops from the goldenrod and the greens and, and reds from the grasses. Um, but in the winter, it's these fluffy seed heads that stand out. This picture on the right I picked because I think it's really interesting that in the summer, if you looked at this, you would say that the grasses were, were the soft texture. They'd be what you wanted to touch and pet. And the evergreens were the pokey or the spiky texture. But as soon as it's winter, those two things flip-flop. If we were to walk up to this landscape today, I would say that the grasses were the bristly, um, you know, kind of sharp texture. And the evergreens were the soft part of the landscape. So we got kind of a, just a change in perspective from one season to another. <clears throat> and then the architecture. So 
sometimes this means the buildings, but in the landscape, we think of, of the bones of the landscape being like the, the lines that we place plants on um, and the shapes that we created with them. And in the summer, some landscapes are designed so that that fades into the background. The architecture's there to create a pattern and make you want to be in the landscape, but you don't really notice it. And in the winter, um, when some of the fluffy, you know, filler plants disappear, we can see very clearly the lines that our landscapes were designed on, um, the way they were meant to direct you to keep moving down the path, or sometimes they're meant to pull you into the garden. Um, or just like, you know, our, our big plants in the summer, this landscape has filler plants around it so that these grasses look like a backdrop. You notice the seed heads above the other plants, um, but you give attention to the entire landscape. In the winter, each one of these clumps of grasses really stands out as like a, a look at me. Look how big and sturdy and cool I am. And then if we put ice and snow on stuff, it gets even more cool. Um, so it's this isn't the same garden, but it's similar with these really big statement grasses. Uh, that even in the winter, they would probably all just look kind of one color, kind of tan. Um, you might notice them, but you might not give them a lot of attention until there's ice on it. And now we have this, this really sturdy architecture of the grasses with the details of the ice on each um, little feather of the seed head. So it just it's just really neat to see how our perspective of, of things changes um, when we put a little ice on them. These trees are right here on campus, just east of our, our offices. And in the summer, this is a tunnel of green. And I love it because who doesn't want to drive down a tunnel of green on their way to work? But that's just kind of what you see. You just see a kind of the trees all turn into one thing. They turn into a tunnel of green that they create together. And in the winter, that disappears, their, their kind of connection to each other disappears and we can see each tree, we can see the shape um, of these vase-like trees, we can see the shape of these rounder trees. Um, if you're doing winter tree ID, that's key to, um, you know, people identify their trees based on the architecture of the branches. And in the winter that stands out to us even more clearly than any other time of year. And then there's the buds. So we can zoom in on the details of these trees and uh, tree buds are just really cool. Um, and some of, the, some of them are there already from the fall. Some of them are just coming on at this time of year. Some um, kind of exist, but they're gonna grow here in the next couple months. So we can look at the details, but we can also watch them change. Um, my magnolias had fuzzy buds on it since last fall. And that's really fun. Um, in the garden in the middle of winter to already be seeing the signs of spring. We can we can kind of remember that it's not it's never gone away completely. And then we have, oh, I just love um, I love sweet gums. They're so fun. And sycamores, I think I talk about that too much as my favorite tree. But sometimes, I mean, it's just really neat to see in the winter the things that stay on the tree from the seed pods that, you know, kind of stay on the tree and drop, consist like keep dropping through the winter. Um, I just was walking down a street in my neighborhood that's lined with old sycamores, really old, huge sycamores. And with no leaves, you can see all of the beautiful peeling bark. And then if you look up in the tree, all the little sycamore balls are still up there. So it's just this really fun texture to look up at this big old tree. And of course, it didn't show up at all well in the picture I tried to take. But you could see all the little balls hanging on the branches like little Christmas balls. Um, and these sweet gum balls, I like to scoop them up and take them to daycare. They Kids use them to, uh, they paint with them. They roll them in paint and then they roll them on their paper um, to make textures with them. And it's just really neat. We have trees that already have their flowers, their catkins on them. Um, they're already ready for spring. They're, they're just waiting for the female flowers to, to bloom in the spring. And then this is a tulip tree flower. It uh, hasn't bloomed since last year, but it stayed 
you know, it just kind of dried there on the tree. And I just thought it was neat. So um, these are just different things that if you stop and look at a tree when you're walking past it, uh, these are the things we can notice um, that, you know, just, just walking quickly, going about our business, we wouldn't maybe even catch our eye. Uh, I love dried flowers in the winter. I just think their textures are so cool. Um, and you can see a different uh, perspective of the flower. So we can see this middle picture is a mountain mint. So in the summer, you never really see this shape. You just see this flat um, pancake of white flower. And in the winter, we can see each one of these holes had its own flower poking out of it. And at one point had a seed in it. I, I took this picture after I'd taken the seeds out of, out of it um, to collect, but we can see exactly how many flowers it took to make up those balls of white that we see covering our plant. Um, these are my alliums that I left standing um, and you can see all the little black seeds in them. I may regret this in the spring when I have baby onions coming up everywhere, but right now, I just love walking past the color contrast of these dark black seeds and the brown flowers. Um, it left something standing in my garden to look at. And then this was ironweed. So in the center here is a puff of purple. Those, these are the actual flowers. And these little petals around it, you don't even see at all in the summer. But in the winter, they look like little daisies. Um, so I did consider cutting this for a dried arrangement. Um, I think that the bees that combined with maybe some dried grasses or something, um, there's not a lot of color to them, but it's, it's just a neat shape. And then this, these are all goldenrod. So I wanted to show how in the summer, um, you know, people will say, how can you tell? I mean, they're all goldenrods. They're just goldenrods. To me. I can't tell the difference. Um, if you grow them and you pay enough attention to them, you start to notice the subtle differences. But in the summer, the green and the bright yellow is still the overwhelming part that you see. And in the winter, when that fades away and we just are left with the seed head, um, we can see the species differences just a little bit more. Um, so we have like a Wichita Mountain goldenrod. Um, I'm not sure what this one is. I know that this one is a uh, sweet goldenrod because it's from my backyard. And we can see, you know, the differences within a genus, um, how those flowers are different. Colors come from a lot of different places in the landscape in the winter. Uh, I've spent a lot of time talking about things that are brown and red, but we have all sorts of things that hold their berries into the winter, um, like our holly bushes. We've got um, dogwoods with their bright red twigs. And then of course, everyone thinks of evergreens with being the green in the winter. But who would have thought that I could pull all winter pictures and come up with that colorful of a slide? And they get a little more snow. Snowberries are white, so they're still, um, you know, they, they stay on the bush. Maybe we don't notice them as much, but they're still a different color. These are, this is a burning bush, um, and I'm not sure what this one is, but sometimes our color comes from the, the you know, fruits that are left. And sometimes the color is brown. Um, sometimes it's the shades of brown. I uh, kind of give my husband a hard time because he says his favorite color is brown. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like my favorite colors are blue and green. I like bright colors. But there's a lot of different color browns. Um, and it doesn't show up very well. I was really kind of disappointed in this picture because it my camera kind of blurred them together. There's like a hundred browns in this picture. And, you know, we've got deep browns with a sturdy texture in these senna seeds. We've got a uh, little blue stem turning red. Um, if you drive out west, the colors get even more vibrant in the grasses, even as they dry. The little blue stems are just brilliant red. Um, and, and, Cray drop seed has its own colors compared to switch grasses. And um, I never, uh, until pretty recently, I didn't appreciate the difference that shades of brown can be. And that brown is 
maybe thought of sometimes as the absence of color in the garden, but it, it is a color itself. And then there's the surprise color. So these pictures are all from my yard from different places where I found green still existing in my landscape. I've got sedges that stayed evergreen here. Actually just kicked these leaves up. Um, and there's some winter creeper that is not my favorite plant, but it was bright lime green still underneath of those leaves had kept it protected. Um, this is some fox sedge that has stayed really deep, deep green in the backyard. And then this is a geranium, a hardy geranium that, that in the leaves, has, it's up against the side of my house um, and, and it's just protected by those leaves and it's stayed really green. Um, so it really, it's, it's really not all gone. You just maybe have to look. And then I could spend um, hours and days taking pictures of ice on things. <laughs> that's what that's what I called my album, pictures of ice on things, because it's just pretty. And it just changes what you see of the texture. Sometimes it shows you a texture you didn't know was there, um, or it just gives you some contrast to appreciate it more. But um, yeah, pictures of ice on things are just lovely. You know, we can get water droplets that froze. We can get, you know, frost crusted seed heads. We can focus in on each droplet, or we can zoom out and see the whole texture of the plant. We can see what happens in an ice storm. I thought these little Rebecca ice balls were just the funniest things. Um, we can get little snow hats <laughs> on our seed heads. Um, this picture is just beautiful. I did not take this picture with the water droplets on the, the grasses, but that is just really neat. It looks like like rain or dew that froze into these little water droplets. And maybe you wouldn't even, without the droplets to point them out, notice these really thin little, you know, strands of the grass. But once they're lined with the little water droplets, they stand out. And then wildlife. We still have lots of wildlife to find in the winter. Um, so one of the reasons why I do like to leave things like goldenrod standing in my yard is for the little birds. Um, I find I've got bird houses or bird feeders in my front yard and they get visited a lot, but no more or less really than my prairie garden in the backyard where they're in the goldenrods and the um, cone flowers and things all winter long picking out these seeds. Um, and it's just, it's fun to watch them go back and forth. We can look, we can check our insect hotels. Um, you know, I'm more of an advocate of leaving stem standing for insects to nest in, and we can check stems for nests. But if you have insect hotels out, you can see what has moved into those. And then we can look for prints. This is a squirrel, <laughs> not super exciting. Um, I wish I had better pictures, but sometimes when I'm outside, I don't take a camera with me. Um, maybe because I don't like to be cold and take my gloves off. But sometimes I just want to appreciate what I'm doing. Um, and a really neat thing to do is just to look for animal tracks and see um, who's visiting. Maybe um, animals are visiting that without the snow to give you evidence in the summer, they're still coming and going from your yard, but you may not happen to see them. Um, we have a fox that visits our yard a lot. And I, I'm sure he visits just as much in the summer, but in the winter, I can see him stand out against the snow and I can see his little tracks. Um, I see how many cats come and go from our yard, probably hanging out under my bird feeders. And then um, I do wanna offer this, this thought is that a lot of people, um, are coming to the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum to learn how to garden better with nature, um, that we're making sure our gardens aren't just pleasing to us, but they're ecologically responsible. And those practices don't end when we're done weeding. Um, they don't end just because it's no longer time to spray herbicide. There's lots of things that we do in the winter that um, you know maybe we need to keep in mind some of our summer goals. And so one of those is the icers. Um, I have a lot of times advised people that the reason their plants aren't doing well right along the side of their driveway is because that's where they sprinkle road salt. And then that's where the melting snow moves 
the salt right into their garden. Um, we end up with really, really salty soils. The reason why it's really hard to plant right along the street if you're trying to plant landscape plants around your mailbox. Um, you know, our road salt can play a big part in our soil health. So there's places we have to use them. Um, I'm not going to sacrifice, you know, safety of people visiting my house for the sake of a plant I want to grow. But um, I don't have to use de-icers everywhere. And sometimes sand or sawdust is just as effective of a solution. Um, we can also, I know my, I'm not a big snow scooper, but my husband is very big on scooping the snow before I drive over it or before it has a chance to turn into ice that we have to deal with. Um, using our remote starts responsibly. Um, do we need to warm the car up when it's 25 degrees or maybe we can tough that one out and just use our remote start when it's six degrees. I did use mine this morning. I'm sure many people did. <laughs> I wasn't that tough. Um, make sure we winterize our hoses and our irrigation system. Um, in the spring, you know, nobody wants to get that surprise water bill when they, they find out that they did not um, unhook their irrigation system and it bust and now we have water leaking into our yard. Um, now, not only have we wasted water, but we have lots more problems. So make sure we winterize our watering system. Um, and then a fun one, especially if you're looking for ways to spend time inside, is that we can make microwavable or use um, rechargeable hand warmer. Um, I love a hand warmer stuck in my pocket or inside my coat. Um, but if we think about what those, those hand warmers that we shake, what's got to be in those to make them hot, um, you know, rice in the microwave does just as good of a job. Um, so maybe that's a craft that we can include in our how to stay green while we're sitting inside on a bed. Okay, so that was outside. Let's move on to how to feel green when we can't go outside, when it's just too cold, it's bad weather, um, or we just don't want to go out in the cold. We can read books. We've done a lot. Um, Michelle has, has done a great job of promoting um, our staff book picks and our bookshop.org account, where we've shared some of our favorite books that are not necessarily how to garden, but garden adjacent. Um, books that, that help us still feel the things that we feel when we're spending time in our garden. I know a couple of favorites for me is like Anne of Green Gables. You would never look at those books and say, those are gardening books, but the descriptions of the plant life and the, the way that she describes interacting with, with the native natural world, um, it's just beautiful and, and always makes me feel, you know, warmer and, and kind of connected to those plants that I can't be working with right now. We can craft. Um, we can make hand warmers, we can craft things for our garden, um, we can make um, labels for our plants, we can make things to hold bird food, we can make things to hold water, um, we, can, we can do all sorts of things. Maybe it's even crafts that um, just remind us of the garden. I know I like to do embroidery and sometimes I'm not making things for my garden, but there's a clear garden theme in the projects that I choose to do. We can collect things. This picture from the bottom is uh, my friends and I have gotten together for several years now and we make our own Christmas wreaths. And we do buy some of the greenery, um, some of the more traditional pieces, but we also go out into the windbreak and cut branches from things that no one will notice missing. Um, just to, well, partly it's a budget. <laughs> it, it's mostly a budget saving um, tactic that if we bought all that greenery, it would get kind of expensive. Um, but we've used collected um, pine cones. We've used different things to decorate those wreaths. Um, if you've ever seen the prairie wreaths Bob makes, those take a little more thinking ahead because we've got to collect plants while they're blooming, dry them, and then in the winter we can craft. Um, but we can put some thought into that ahead of time or maybe just, you know, partner up with people who do collect and maybe we can offer the tea and the warm garage and somebody who um, is a little more more on top of planning ahead in the middle of the summer can bring the, the crafting supplies. And the last one is clean and sharpen your tools. 
I am probably turning into a little bit of a broken record around here when it comes to sharpening your shovels. <laughs> it makes your job so much easier when you're planting. And nobody wants to stand there in the middle of May with their driveway full of plants and take the time to sharpen their spade. But we can do it on a nice day in February. Um, we can, you know, get some WD-40 and clean up our, our, um, our spades and our trowels, replace your pruner blades, um, make sure that we've got replaced or fixed anything we broke last year, um, and just set ourselves up so that when it's time to start planting, there's nothing to stop us. We've, we've got what we need. Find the five-gallon buckets without holes. That's on my goal. Um, seems like every time I pick up a five-gallon bucket, it's got a hole in it. So I'm going to make sure that before spring, I have a couple five-gallon buckets stacked up that no one has cracked or drilled holes in. Oh, here's some more pictures of crafting. So um, we, we've, I think we've talked before, maybe just in podcast episodes, but about making bird food. So um, I think we've shared some recipes about making our own suet feeders. That's that molded square bird food that you set inside the wire holder. Um, but we can use things like peanut butter or lard and bird seed and fruit pieces and make our own in fun shapes. Um, they make fun gifts. I have never done this, but it looks beautiful. I have no idea how much the birds would care. I did try to string some cranberries this year, and they're still hanging in my tree. So either I don't have cranberry liking birds, or it was just not a good idea. I'm not sure. But I threw out, I had some cuties that were too dry for me to want to eat. And I cut them in half and I threw them out on the ground under my bird food eater and they loved them. They picked those things apart and the squirrels ran off with them. Um, so, and it added color. It was this nice little orange pop of color under my bird feeder in, in the winter. And so I just thought this was really pretty. And if anyone tries it, I want to know if the birds actually visited it. But basically they just lined up fruit and then filled it with water so it froze and held it all in place. And the birds presumably could pick out the fruit. Here's some examples of uh, garden markers that you could craft, but really you don't need me to tell you how to craft. Pinterest is, is absolutely full of things that you can make to put in your garden. Uh, here's some of the collections we have around the office of things that we've brought in from the outdoors. These are two dried arrangements that I have. Um, this is actually from an NSA event we did in 2018 with some dried prairie flowers and it's still sitting on my desk looking beautiful. Uh, this is a branch of ponderosa pine from my in-laws out west with funny little tufts of moss on it that I just like and it makes me smile when I look at it. Um, I have it right here. That's really neat. And this is Toby's office. He's got, you know, He's got the collection. If you need bugs or mushrooms or bark or bird's nest, you can find it. The last thing we can do, and I didn't want to spend too much time on this because I feel like it is like the idea that people give gardeners to do in the winter. Well, if you want to think about your garden, you should plan your garden for next year. And you can get an app and you can get a, a blog post and you can get everything to help you do that. And most of them will happily take your money um, to give you something to do in the winter. And I just wanted to add a challenge to that. That as we're planning our gardens, plan ahead not just for the excitement of spring when we want to plant everything that's green. And we, you know, working in the greenhouse, I can tell you that if stuff is blooming, that's the stuff that sells. Sometimes we need to buy the stuff that's not blooming so that our whole garden doesn't end up being entirely designed around what looks good in May. Um, we can think about what looks good through the whole year. And if you want to plan ahead to make sure you've got some neat things to see next winter, uh, here's some things we can look at. We can mix shrubs into our perennials. We can mix grasses into our perennials. We don't have to have these separate parts. We don't have, this is where I plant shrubs, and this is where I plant my grasses, and this is where I plant my perennials. We can mix all those things together so that um, each part of our yard has something to offer us in the winter. Make sure 
that we're not just planting one texture. I have a tendency in the spring, I am just very attracted to anything that's fluffy and soft. Because that's what spring feels like in my mind. And in the summer, I like things that are a little more prairie-esque, maybe a little spikier or um, taller. And if I didn't think about that when I was buying plants in May, I would never have any of those plants. And so if I think about the textures I like to see in the winter, I like really stiff textures that'll hold the snow and ice. And I like grasses with big fluffy seed heads that'll last all winter long. And I like shrubs that hold some berries or some leaves so that there's something to look at and something for my birds to sit in. Uh, and we can, so we can think about the wildlife too. What will pull the wildlife into our yard? Making sure we use prairie plants that provide seeds that turn into food for them. Um, making sure that we have, you know, shrubs that don't just produce berries to eat in the spring, but we have some of the shrubs that produce berries that ripen and last into the winter. Um, and then we can think about those collections we talked about. What would you like to collect and use? Um, do you want to start doing grass arrangements? If so, make sure, you know, we plant a variety of grasses with different seed heads. Um, do we like pine cones? Do we like evergreen plants? Um, you know, what do we like to use? Um, I am going to, every year I add more herbs and I think that this is the year I'm going to stop. Who, who needs to use many herbs? But I dry those and every winter about this time of year, I'm like, man, I really wish I'd taken the time to dry a few more herbs because they're just better than the grocery store one. So I do dedicate a significant amount of space to herbs because it's what I like to use. <clears throat> um, that's the end of my pictures. So I just wanted to share all the different ways that you can connect with us. The list is getting kind of long. <laughs> so um, we've got these plant talks that we'll take a break with here for a little bit. Um, but we have a podcast through our Bloombox program that's hosted by me and Hannah um, that runs all year long. Uh, Michelle does an excellent job with Facebook and Instagram, keeping you all up to date on either thought-provoking things or tips or um, educational opportunities. Um, we do have a Pinterest. Um, we have a Pinterest for the Arboretum, and we also have a Pinterest for Bloombox. And we try to keep them kind of, kind of different so that you're not seeing the same content. We're really working on our YouTube lately. Um, that's where this talk will end up being hosted. And then you can always email us. And of course, plantnebraska.org is the umbrella where you can find all of these things. So thank you for spending some time looking at pretty winter pictures with me. Thanks, Sarah. So a couple of things I took away. There was so much in there. Um, but one, just the that there's so much to see in winter and we sort of overlook it I do yeah I'm kind of a winter complainer and I say like <laughs> oh it's like so brown and gray and ugly and but it's not you just have to look a little more closely yeah and I think winter helps us sort of tune into our senses even more because it kind of forces us to work a little bit harder but there's so much beauty in interest in the winter landscape so thank yeah. you for reminding us to take time I, to enjoy winter I told you yesterday that I was really glad the weather shifted because <laughs> this talk would have been really boring if it was still 55 degrees outside right. <laughs> I know we keep so thinking like oh winter's I, over it's not yeah. thank you to the weather for cooperating but I feel bad for everybody who's buried in snow right now hopefully they're appreciating it the other thing that really resonated with me was the importance of leaving when we can our leaves and our stems and our seed heads, um, because not only do they provide visual interest for us, but they provide habitat, like you said, for insects, food for birds. And um, yeah, there's just a lot of good reasons for, for leaving that kind of all that stuff around in your backyard in the winter. Yeah, 
I'm just going to go through and address a couple comments you gave me a chance to read. Um, yeah, there's some in there. Yeah, Melissa, I see your comment from LES and I will email you. I copied your email. Um, thank you to other people saying their cranberry strings were a bust. I was really bummed about that. Um, I have a, a three-year-old and we had so much fun stringing that. And I ended up sneaking outside and taking it down because that the birds weren't eating it. Yeah, mine is still just lying on the ground in yeah. my front yard, like moldering into the earth at this point. So <laughs> nobody liked ask, it. Not even the squirrels, which kind of really. Eat it no. must have just been not a cranberry eating year. I guess. I would, I do always, when we talk about that, I like to point out to make sure that we're using um, like cotton string especially because of this problem, um, that if we use like polyester or something, it becomes a hazard to a lot of the animals. Um, Good point. Steve, Roth, thank you for pointing out Ohio State um, Bee Lab courses. They have, I take, I listen to those all the time. They have some amazing um, free education that you can listen into. Yeah. Yeah. Kathy had some suggestions too for uh, Xerxes.org has some. I love Xerxes stuff. I, mm -hmm. That's a rabbit hole I have to make sure I have time for when I go to their website. Yeah. Conservation Nebraska too does some great ones and Nebraska Game and Parks. And our own Bob Hendrickson was on with Conservation Nebraska this week on Tuesday, I think it was, talking about um, herbs. Um, and all the good things that you can make from garden herbs, from tinctures and um, oils to kind of aromatherapies and soaps and how to use them in, in your dishes. And yeah. it was really interesting. Now, I just looked at Conservation Nebraska's YouTube. And I don't think they posted that video yet, but Bob has done a whole series for them on um, edible plants. That's kind of his specialty mm. area. So there's two or three of those videos over there right now. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone. I hope you stay warm. And if any of you are in parts of the state that got more snow, um, I hope it's at least a little enjoyable. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get to spring soon. But yeah, thank you guys for coming by and we will send out this recording. And also, like I said earlier, a little survey early next week just to get your ideas for future plant top topics, uh, plant talk topics, that's hard to say, um, <laughs> next year, because we'll do this again in the winter when we all have a little more time to relax and talk about plants and trees. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Mm -hmm.